So, uh, before I actually start lecturing, just a couple of quick questions from you. Maybe I'll have to ask them again when more people come. Okay, I'll stop sometime in the middle and uh, I need to know who's registered and how they're going to evaluate this course, who is taking this course for present. But I think let's give five more minutes. Okay, so let me start today's lecture. Um, so, so far we have been discussing in fairly good amount of detail the vacuum solution of this equation that's uh, described that's spherically symmetric and described by the Schwarz scale metric. And we analyzed the metric in various different ways and came to the conclusion that it's smooth at the horizon, it's singular at the origin. And uh, when we pass through the horizon, something happens to the causal structure of space time, which <coughs> makes sure that you can go in to that thing, but you can't come out from it. And that's why we call this object such an object a black hole. Now, of course, it need not be a black hole if it has a radius of matter up to some large distance greater than 2 gm. In that case, it's a short cell solution outside and completely harmless solution. And inside, it will have some matter. And this matter may or may not, depending on the situation, uh, collapse and go inside the horizon. And only after, if it does, then all kind of things will take place. Because once the matter is inside, then it is subject to the same force which we already saw propels any particle to the center in a finite. So imagine that there is some distribution of matter. So in other words, what I am trying to say is this. A naive picture, <coughs> which is not correct, would be that this is the horizon. Now suppose the matter distribution is everywhere here. Then of course the existence of the horizon is meaningless to us. Because all we can say is that outside this radius, there is a short cell solution. This is not naive, this is a correct picture. What is naive is to say, okay, the opposite situation is that there is some matter sitting here inside. Okay. So this one is of course, this is correct, this is not a black hole. But this picture itself has something wrong with it. <coughs> because it is not possible for a lump of matter to just sit inside the horizon of a black hole. There is somehow an implication in this picture that it is sitting there in a time independent way. But that is what it can't do. Because consider each particle of this supposed matter distribution. Each such particle has a law governing it that dr by dt in the infalling direction is greater than 1 over something I derived last time. I think this is the right expression. Right? Remember I found a bound on dr by d tau. This is tau, it's proper time. So that means that this entire shell, the outermost shell of matter, d. sorry? It's probably d tau by d <coughs> It's dr by d tau that means it's dr by d tau, it's only that this is substance. It has to be d tau by dr is bounded below, right? That's a minimum velocity. If d tau by dr was bounded below, then it would be a maximum velocity. The whole point is that this doesn't this is incompatible with r being independent of tau. Okay. So any particle that's inside here is not allowed to stay there forever in its own proper time. It has to move radially inwards. That means every shell is going to move radially inwards. That means applying exactly the same analysis that we already did to each particle in this whole thing, this whole thing is going to be in a state of collapse. It's going to keep moving in. Okay. So <coughs> this really speaking going to be a, uh, a, a dynamical situation. So naive refers to the idea that everything just sits over there. Okay. If you were to 
to believe in the naive picture that there's a lump of matter sitting inside the horizon, then of course you could say, well, after that the solution becomes regular after the horizon. Exactly as we say here, we say that up to here there's outside there's vacuum and when we cross this matter boundary then the solution is regular inside. That is true. But in this case that argument doesn't hold that it's regular outside this and it is regular outside this, that much is true. But it's not the case that the presence of matter just masks the singularity completely. Okay? Because the matter can't just sit there. The matter is continually in a state of falling in. If there is matter inside. So just, just a comment, yes. <coughs> yeah, but it's a time dependent situation. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the but point is that it's not a, it's not something static. This is something completely static. But in fact, what's happened here, as you already saw, is that the radial direction inside the horizon is time-like. It's no longer space-like. Okay. And then coupled with this bound, you see that this cannot be some static situation. That's all I'm trying to say. Just a very brief bound. Okay. So now, <coughs> with all that in mind. We want to introduce, finally and for the first time in practice, some energy momentum tensor and try to solve these equations in the presence of an energy momentum tensor and ask how it affects the picture we already made. In particular, though we won't actually write it down in complete detail, in particular we expect there should be some solution compatible with the first picture I drew. namely. Vacuum outside some radius r tilde which is greater than the horizon, and then some non singular solution, perfectly non singular, all the way to r equals 0 inside. And that you could call a star. That would be a reasonable thing to call a star. Okay? Completely non exotic object, but, has, but described in general relativity in a particular way. Okay. So that should be there, and we'll argue at least most of the argument that it should be there. Uh, I'm not sure if I can actually complete the argument. So now the question is, what do we put for T nu nu? What can T nu nu be? So <clears throat> we saw that fundamentally what T nu nu is, is the energy momentum tensor of some system of fields. So for example, it can be a half T nu phi minus some extra terms for a klein gordon field or it can be uh, <coughs> something made out of gauge fields again there are different ways to contract the indices but something basic uh, it has to be second rank tensor and it, uh, for a free field theory it is just bilinear in the field so in Klein Gordon theory is like this, in Maxwell theory it's like this, and so on. Okay, so you can have various energy momentum tensors uh, for any given field theory. But of course, if you put that in, what you will get is a coupled set of equations for the gravitational field and one of these other fields. Then you also need to write the field equation of that other field, which could be the Klein Gordon equation or the Maxwell equation, and you need to solve the coupled system. Okay, so is that clear? That's sort of the most general thing you can do. Uh, <coughs> so you get couple equations for the metric and phi, a scalar field or vector field, etc. The classic application of this would be if this is the energy momentum tensor for the electromagnetic field. In that case, you could solve this equation and <coughs> you could get, for example, a charged black hole. You could find a classical solution that describes the charged analog of the short shield black hole with an electric charge. And then the solving the Maxwell equation in that background would give you the electric field or the magnetic field of that charged black hole. So you would solve simultaneously for the metric and the field. The metric is one field after all. Okay? Just think of what, what's a general charged object. It's got, it's, a, it's got a mass, so it's gravitating, so it has a gravitational field. It's also got a charge, so it's 
giving off an electromagnetic field. So these kind of equations are coupled equations for both these fields and the solution will tell us the gravitational field and the charge field, right, the electromagnetic field and any other fields of the object. But of course this is not what we always want to do. We often want to just treat the energy momentum tensor often, almost always actually, treat T mu nu as <coughs> an effective quantity generalizing its zero zero component which as we know is related to density. If you remember how we started to discover general relativity was by noticing that T00 is related to matter density. So we want it now here in this case T00 is also given by something made out of fields but we don't have to know that we can just say let me take matter of a certain density. Okay then I forget where that density came from. It came from some other fields. I don't worry about those. I just treat the density as an independent variable. This is what I mean by effective quantity. You see that? In reality, all densities in nature are due to some combination of fields. All densities, even the density of water. But of course, when we study water, we are not so foolish as to say, well, water is made up of fermions and bosons and its density 1 gram per cc is some condensate of these fields. We just say the density is rho of x and in normal conditions it's 1 gram per cc. So we just make that the independent variable. And with a few independent variables, we can then write these equations and solve them. However, there is one price to pay. If you treat various parameters in T mu and as independent variables, then you won't get enough equations to determine all of them. Okay? Because what is this equation supposed to do? It's supposed to determine G mu nu. You can't expect it to determine everything for you. It is many equations because of the values of mu and nu. But finally, you need some internal relations among the variables of T mu and nu. And those relations are generally known as equation of state. Okay. What we will see is that in the most simple typical situation, rho is generalized by the addition of pressure and the two variables are density and pressure and then uh, there is a bunch of equations which tell you the gravitational field for distribution with some density and pressure and there are also relations among the density and pressure which is an equation of state. Once you have all of those then you can solve for the versus. Okay. Good. Now recall, so let's see, uh, I need to do a couple of things about the energy momentum tensor before we get down to this. Uh, first of all, let's recall what happens in flat space time where special relativity applies. Okay. So let's assume that we are not thinking about gravity for the moment. But that T mu nu describes some <coughs> perfect fluid of matter uh, and perfect by perfect fluid we mean that it does not have things like heat, so we neglect heat conduction, viscosity, dissipation and so on.
So these are functions of x, y, z, and t. The reason why these are all uh, equal and the off-diagonal ones are zero comes from isotropy and homogeneity. The fact that this part, the three by three part, is proportional to the identity matrix means it's completely invariant under SO3, which are rotations of space. <coughs> okay. And is the only matrix with that property which uniquely fixes that has to be proportional to a single function. So that function we call P. And we'll see as we go on, and you can see in many other ways that it's really to be thought of as the pressure. So the two variables for such a system are density and pressure. And uh, now we can ask the question, what about general space time? <clears throat> okay, and this was also in the rest frame. So there's a nice trick which allows us to generalize this formula to uh, an arbitrary space-time with the metric G union, which is the following. Given a perfect fluid in any space-time, uh, T union is a second rank symmetric tensor. Okay? The perfect fluid is characterized by its velocity four vector. U mu doesn't matter here whether it's up or down, but it starts like as having one index up. Okay, so T mu nu being a second rank symmetric tensor uh, must be determined either by some property of the space time, which is the second rank tensor, or <coughs> by the velocity. And it's easy to see that these are the only two invariants. That you can have. Now, in principle, I'm not sure why you can't have uh, higher dimensional invariants like R mu nu and other bilinears made out of R, but I think uh, the assumption here is that it doesn't depend on derivatives of the metric. So, in this case, we just have to reparameterize this matrix in terms of this by keeping so in mind. Yeah, um, I think the basic argument is this that we are thinking of a situation where fields are slowly varying. Okay, it's actually also a similar argument for studying Einstein's equations at all. They are the equations from the action root G R, but nobody stops you correcting that action by a term root G times R squared or root G times R mu lambda rho R mu lambda. So in principle, there could be corrections to Einstein's action, and there could be corrections to <coughs> uh, but we simply won't consider it. Okay. Now u mu is the velocity for vector and in the rest frame, so u mu has to satisfy u mu, sorry, I'm still in flat space. I haven't yet gone to the general space. So in flat space, u mu u mu equals minus 1 implies that u mu is the vector 1, 0, 0, 0. When each particle of this fluid is massive, so the massive condition is p squared equals minus m squared, which becomes u squared equals minus 1, and so u is that. And from that, we see that, uh, my notes have done it with t upper mu nu, so I hope I don't get some sign wrong, but I think it's okay. Um, in any case, um, now t is 0, 0. Therefore, is alpha times u0, u0, which is 1, and minus beta, because beta 0, 0 is 1, while ti i is simply beta, because u in the rest frame is 1. Okay? So I compare this, this with these. What is the sign of the matrix? Is it minus plus plus? It's minus plus plus plus. Has been the beginning of this virus. Okay. Good. So, in this parameterization, alpha and beta are related to T00 and TII like that, but T mu is also this diagonal matrix. So, we can compare, and by comparing this, we see that T mu 
is actually P plus rho mu 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 plus P theta mu. Okay, so this has the desired property because alpha minus beta is T zero zero which has to be rho and beta is T i i which has to be P. So this is correct. But now this equation, which I have derived in the rest frame, is completely covariant in special relativity, so it can be valid in any frame where u mu is the velocity in that frame. Moreover, its form manifestly tells me how to generalize it to general relativity because u mu concept still exists. I just have to remember that u lower mu is lower from this with the metric, and eta has to be replaced by the metric itself. So this is much more complicated because now this object can have a dependence on space-time coordinates through the fact that g mu is not constant. Okay, but this is the general formula for the energy momentum tensor of a static isotropic homogeneous fluid, and now we can just try to use this to solve Einstein's equations in the presence of matter. Okay, so is that clear? Earlier it was zero. Now we will get some new solution, but that new solution, if I put p and rho to zero, should go back to the old structural solution. Yes. Uh, Matter is introduced that particle particle fit on assumption. Yeah. So that assumption basically. <coughs> so let's see. Um, yeah. So if it wasn't a perfect fluid, what would change in this? Probably so of that. Sorry. Probably of that. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, the Tijs will then have uh, other, I mean, you will recognize Tijs as yeah, pressures. Yeah, yeah, I think the question is though we are talking of, we are assuming it's isotropic and homogeneous. That's what fixes the octet. The Tij is basically a stress tensor, so that will yes. probably give out other terms. That's correct, that's correct. But I'm just trying to understand probably the question was what aspect of perfect fluid, if I uh, violate. Uh, what will uh, so if I, for example, if I allow heat conduction, viscosity, whatever? Yes, it's clear that I'll get other components of the stress energy tensor. But if you ask me now exactly which components for which thing, that will probably can't. It's probably so. I think it's well known. So that's the cause why we are taking the combination of mu 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 mu. Yeah, in mu. No, that doesn't. This doesn't uh, rely on any of this. The point is. This is the form depending only on two functions rho and p. That is the statement of homogeneous isotropic perfect. Okay. Actually, we can take it almost as a definition if we like. Then we have to convince ourselves that it's a reasonable definition of stress energy tensor for such a thing. Okay. This is general for something that's characterized only by its velocity. Now, if the fluid has some other thing characterizing it, then that thing could appear here. Okay. As long as it's characterized only by its velocity for vector, then that and this invariant uh, of space-time are the only two second rank objects we can make. Anyway, this is all motivation to finally end up with this T menu, and now we need to solve Einstein equations for that T. Yes. So, in the final equation, is it homogeneous because if it is a function, T menu is a function of x and t. Yes, yes. So the point is that the question then is what do you mean by homogeneous? Okay. Homogeneous is very clearly defined in special relativity in the absence of gravity because it says look around you every direction is the same. Okay, that's isotropic. Sorry, homogeneous is translate yourself to another place, physics is the same. Now, general relativity doesn't actually say that anymore because if the metric is non trivial, for example, I am the metric of the sun, then I translate myself into the core of the sun, obviously, life is not the same as outside. So, what we are doing. So there are two ways to think of this. One probably the correct way is to define all these uh, concepts in the language of tangent frames to the manifold, which since I haven't introduced for you, I can't do that now. Another is to say, let's assume T mu nu corresponds to such a fluid in flat space-time, and let's generalize its form to an arbitrary curved space-time, just requiring it to remain a second rank tensor. In other words, this one is the energy momentum tensor of a homogeneous isotropic perfect fluid, and this one is its GR version. You could argue that. Okay, because after all, GR, the whole point of GR is that there are gravitational fields around, and gravitational fields violate, violate the homogeneous and isotropic uh, thing. So it's, in some sense, 
it's still homogeneous and isotropic, but only because of the of the metric. It doesn't have its own. Uh, it doesn't make its own contribution to inhomogeneity. And the best way is to just say that this is the definition of such a stress energy tensor. It's a very reasonable definition. Means any kind of inhomogeneity or non-isotropy because of metric, we don't care. Anything else, don't. We don't care in the sense it's not in our control. It's part of space time. I mean, yeah. <coughs> then also you can call it a uh, homogeneous. Yeah, I really don't think it matters what we call it. Yeah, I suppose we could call it that. What matters for me at least is this equation. part 
which has a very characteristic signature of having density, effectively the contribution to density and pressure variables being equal and opposite and being proportional or actually equal to the value of the constant lambda. So it's constant pressure, constant density and pressure in E is equal to minus density. It still leaves open the question whether this density is positive or negative depending on the sign of lambda because lambda is the way allowed to choose the sign of lambda. Okay. So you should think that merely that it behaves in equations the cosmological term behaves like the contribution. If it behaves like that in equations, it will behave like that in experiments too, like a contribution to T min mu having constant. So this is certainly not a general characteristic of T min mu. The rho and P need not be constant. that with such a very striking uh, property, uh, it should be possible to pin down with, an ex with experiments whether this is actually the case. That is to say, if an experiment uh, detects something that we compute from solving this equation and it finds that effectively uh, the pressure and the density are coming out to be constant and equal and opposite of each other after subtracting all other effects from all the other energy momentum tensors contributing in that experiment, then it would be telling us that such a term is present and the value of the rho that it finds as well as the effective sign of rho which is can be both ways would determine lambda. And today we know that lambda is a very small positive number which you can find in books. And it's a very interesting uh, open problem uh, in gravitational physics, why it's there and why it's so small. It was thought to be identically zero, uh, let's say even right through the mid 80s it was assumed that it was identically zero and now experimentally you know that it's not. Anyway, that's not the goal of my this not here's the value. So rho experiment tells us that rho of the vacuum, it's called rho of the vacuum because T menu, suppose we assume T menu is zero. Okay. So then it's the rho which is actually the same as lambda. So that's what we call rho of the vacuum. And experimentally it's determined to be in energy units. So it's a density 10 to the minus 8, I think, per cc. And this can also be written in energy units where it's a little more striking, it's 10 to the minus 12 GeV per fourth. You can convert the three length dimensions in the denominator to energy units in the numerator, so you get four powers of energy. Okay. It's also obvious from the fact that lambda multiplies integral d for x. Integral d for x has four, four units of length. So to cancel it, it must have four units of energy, four powers of energy. And that's the scale. The point is that this is not a scale uh, familiar to us in particle physics where the fundamental scales are typically masses of particles or the interaction strengths or the weak interactions, strong interactions. All of those are way up in the EV and above EV range. And GEV, GEV, now EV range. Uh, but nothing is, this is uh, 10 to the minus 12, so 12 orders of magnitude down from the range of typical values and then 4 to the 4th power. So it's a very strange problem. Why it's so unnaturally small? Okay. Good. That was a digression. But a good one to make because then we can forget about this term and do this with a T-menu parameterized in terms of pressure and rho. And if we feel like solving the equation with the lambda, we'll just put P equals minus rho and we are done. This is a special case. Okay. Before I start that, now that everyone is here, 
so following few announcements first of all can i know who uh, are taking this course for credit one so i will uh, try to subject for okay okay you will let me know so otherwise one two three four five six precisely six huh? there is nobody who is missing who actually who is supposed to take it fine so my plan is as follows uh today and uh, so day after tomorrow i'll wrap up the study of spherically symmetric solutions day after i'll talk about black holes again but this time in somewhat more general key maybe more general types of black holes and maybe also some aspects of uh, what is called the penrose diagram which helps us to analyze black holes then from next week i'll switch to cosmology and i will talk about cosmology for the next five lectures or so and then i will actually stop uh, on 12th of november will be the last lecture of this course in uh, unless there are some extra ones in december because i'll be busy after that hmm. now what i propose for the six people who are uh, i do not to take too much time here discussing it but for the people who are registered uh, i would like that each person do a study project uh, over a period of 3 4 weeks and write a report of 4 to 5 pages not longer and give a talk up about half an hour to four minutes it could be on we will have to work out the sub, uh, the topics you will have to work them out in consultation with me but it could be i don't know just to throw out some topics uh, they could be some uh, you know, could talk about rotating black holes you could talk about um, anything that i haven't gone into in detail in the course but is also important in the course some aspect of cosmology or you could talk about formalism and uh, for example if one person is little mathematically inclined they could do fermions in the gravitational field that's a very interesting field theory problem so things like that and then the same will hold seminars around 15th of december okay does this suit everybody who is involved in the december yeah what happened on 15th of december they supposed to come back on that day okay so 15th of december doesn't mean in the morning uh, at 6 in the morning it could be the next day or could be the next day okay there is some room for negotiation now huh? okay fine. okay fine so uh, around that period we we'll make sure that people are back from prayer for okay and if there is some very very pressing need for me to give an exam ah, so there should also be an exam right this is not the only exam but i don't want to make it a very long exam because it, then it means i have to correct it so very simple and self interest so we'll do some i don't know some kind of finite kind of exam just to test some concepts around in the same period so the details are announced but i just wanted to make sure everyone is self interest Right. Anyway, that will be after 15th of yeah. In the period around 16th to 20, 21st, 22nd. Also, because after that, I think you people have other things to do. Yeah, think so. Ah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you want it postponed further, it would be. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it should be over by end of December, as far as I am concerned. Ah, end of December is too far. Too far. Good. So there you are. Uh, what I thought is that uh, the thing is, yeah, just that for you, you have the seminar and the exam probably in the same. Yeah, okay. So the exam three four days later. Yeah, three four days. So let's let's do a rough thing. Sixteenth or seventeenth December for the seminars, and nineteenth or twentieth for the exam. Okay. Now, uh, so hence for team we were team union. Okay. Now uh, there is a story of raised and lowered indices. So it's really going to be. Ah, so this is an issue. Yes. Uh, probably this means that in spirit, what I wrote earlier was not such a good. Mm -hmm. No, no. This is correct. So T mu is always. P plus rho u mu u mu plus P g mu nu. So this equation cannot be wrong, okay? And it's true also if all the indices on both sides are raised, okay? But now it doesn't mean that the components of P mu nu will only be P and rho because they'll include factors from g and factors from u, which could be not true. So let's decide that. 
First of all, again we assume spherical symmetry, which is at least consistent with our choice of T B mu. So our solution that we are looking for is going to be parameterized exactly the same way as before with this. Sir? Yes. With this, as we are trying to solve this equation, yeah. we are trying to find out G mu. We are trying to find G mu solving as, this equation. Yeah. But we may find some relation among P and rho also because there are many equations here. No, uh, but I'm saying that uh, if, if I don't know a priori what the genius are going to be, yes. how can I claim that uh, there will be a straight result? Yeah, so I must, so I'm, there may be many. So just as I solved with the vacuum, I solved this equation equal to zero. That time also I can't prove that there is spherical symmetry. I can, in fact, there is not in general spherical symmetry. I am only looking for the spherically symmetric solution. There are many solutions. The one problem with uh, general relativity because of its extreme non-linearity is that just because there is an uh, equation, I mean there is nothing unique about solutions unless I specify many things. I could specify boundary behavior or boundary conditions or some symmetry or something. And if I relax that, I will get more general solutions. Okay. One of the best ways to realize that is that you just take a metric of a star and perturb it, just poke it in some place. Okay. That will violate spherical symmetry. Of course, then it may become time dependent, it will radiate, it will do all sorts of things. And but spherical symmetry, huh? spherical symmetry thing yes. and time dependent, yes. these two things are different. These two things are different. However, Burkhoff's theorem, which I can't yeah. never remember the exact statement, basically says that they are the same. The spherically symmetric uh, solutions are all uh, time dependent. Isn't that only for vacuum? That's only for vacuum. So here what we are going to do is to look for a spherically symmetric solution of this form. The reason, again, the motivation is very obvious. We already know this form of the solution in the vacuum. And we are going to come down to the surface of a star with that solution. Now it has to match on to a solution inside. Okay? And the star is spherically symmetric. It's the object we are trying to describe. Right? We know that it's spherically symmetric in advance. So we simply put in, I mean, of course, again, not any, you know, it's not an exact description of a star, but in first approximation a star is spherically symmetric. So we are just trying to find a metric which will have this property that it's short still outside and it matches on to something inside. So this is the answer we are going to make for that as before. And the equations are going to be very similar except that first we need to decide what are the components of P mu nu in terms of P and rho. So given this metric, u mu u mu equals minus 1 tells me that uh, u mu u mu g mu mu equals minus 1. In the rest frame, now let's go to the rest frame of u, which means that u takes the form u p comma 0 0 0. So then ut squared times uh, gtt uh, minus e to the, the upper tt, so minus 2 alpha is equal to minus 1. So we get ut is equal to e to the alpha. So that's the first thing we need to keep in mind. <coughs> So in the rest frame, u mu is e to the alpha 0, 0, 0. That means this term has an e to the 2 alpha in the time frame component. Similarly, the other term, okay, so let's, without any further ado, let's just write it. So the first term is e to the 2 alpha, this is tt component, so p plus rho into e to the 2 alpha minus p into e to the 2 alpha, so rho e to the 2 alpha. So it still has the property that the first term depends only on rho, but with a dependent space-time dependent scaling alpha. Okay, alpha is of course by spherical symmetry only a function of r, and in fact rho and p will also be only functions of r by the same assumption. Okay, now let's look at the rr component. In the rr component this is 0, 
and this will just give me p into the 2 beta. Then theta theta component gives me p times r squared, and this gives me p r squared sine squared theta. So this is t. Now one slightly unfortunate thing is that earlier in vacuum we could solve R mu nu equals 0 because if this whole thing was 0 then by taking the place we found that R mu nu itself is 0 but now it's non-zero so we have to calculate the whole left hand side of this thing or we can recast the equation as R mu nu equals some combination of t's but either way it's an extra complication and so I'm just going to write down you might I might have mentioned that G mu nu is the notation for R mu nu minus a half G mu nu R. And it's not to be confused with any metric. And in this system, GTT is 1 by R squared e to the 2. You can check that these equations reduce to the ones in your notes if you take suitable linear combinations. Okay, so GTT is actually RTT which is in your notes. So I might, you might have R upper T lower T you have to lower it. Then you have to calculate R from whatever you have in the notes and then subtract these. So you should find these expressions. This is GTT. Then GRR is 1 by R square. R alpha prime plus 1 minus e to the 2 beta and g theta theta is R squared e to the minus 2 beta But we would be lucky 
okay? Because we have parameterized the metric in a particular way in terms of alpha and beta. So it could be that the only derivatives which show up are first derivatives and you see that's the case. These are first order differential equations which is nice. G theta theta turns out to be a genuine second order differential equation which is not at all so nice. This you can actually tell from here. You see there's alpha double prime here. So it will be a second order equation. So instead of that, this particular derivation has taken from Sean Carroll's book. I suppose he's taken it from somewhere. Uh, instead of uh, using the third equation, we'll also use d mu t mu r equals 0. If you think about it, d mu t mu nu is 0 for all values of nu. That's the conservation, covariant conservation of the energy momentum tensor. But in this system, this is going to differentiate something like rho or p. And also, there will be a connection term gamma times t that will involve g. Okay, and first derivative of g also. So, in fact, it will be a first order differential equation involving all the variables of interest to us, alpha, beta, p, and rho. Okay, and it turns out to be independent of these two. Therefore, it really corresponds to knowing the first integral of the theta theta equation. That's good. So, these are all three first order equations, which is why we have. Yeah. So, this is some, this will be an equation. This is an, from inspection, equation relating alpha, beta, p and rho, because p and rho are the components of t, and alpha and beta occur in the affine connection term gamma, which is in the definition of t. Okay. And it's first order. So, it's a first order equation. First order because it only involves the Christoffel symbol gamma, and gamma has only first order in there. So, we will take this to be equation 1, this to be equation 2, and this to be equation 3, which I still have to write out in detail. The point is that this will, will be a substitute for using the G theta theta equation. Okay, being first order, that being second order, that is this. Okay, now many good things are happening for us in this system. First of all, again, it didn't have to be so, but the first equation doesn't even involve alpha. Okay, It's only an equation between beta and rho, so it determines beta in terms of rho. That's great. So let's get that out of the way and then worry about the others. Actually, then we can also see what will happen. In this equation, beta is already determined in terms of rho, so alpha will be determined in terms of rho and p. The third equation, however, will, uh, yeah, okay, so let's, let's find out what the third equation does later. Let's go step by step. Now, to solve one, by the way, one of the reasons I'm doing this on the board, you can look up these kind of things in books. One of the reasons is to stress what does it teach us about how to solve Einstein's equations, okay? These are absolutely baby class Einstein equations. They are just next in complication after the vacuum ones. Okay, there are many, many, many more. The question is, how do you proceed? What do you look out for? Do you just take this thing and wonder how to change variables and so on? In fact, because it's a physical system, it keeps giving us guidance what we should do. Okay. So the guidance in this case uh, is that we know the solution to solve one. We know the solution. or rho equals 0, because we've already solved it in a recent class. And the solution there is that e to the 2 beta is equal to uh, 1 over 1 minus 2 g m by r. Right? Therefore, where m is a constant, capital M is a constant, change variables from by defining, this is an answer to help us solve the equation, e to the 2 beta r 
Okay, this will confuse you because this is in another system, right? So this is not e to the two beta for us. This is just a, a side comment. This is what it was in the so beta vacuum, in the vacuum solution. Okay. Our beta will simply take e to the two beta and define it to be one over one minus two g m of r over r. So that changes variables from beta of r to m of r, a new function, which we still don't know. What's the benefit? If it's a vacuum solution, when rho is zero, m will be constant and equal to capital M. Okay. Therefore, it's plausible that the equation we get for small m of r by substituting this into this will be simpler than this equation. Understand? When you know an equation for a solution of an equation for a particular case, it also suggests you a change of variables. Is that clear? It's a good change of variables. Anyway, it can't hurt. You can always try it. And it's uh, worth doing. It's a few lines of calculations which are there in my notes. And you find that under this, LHS of 1 simply becomes 2 G M prime of R one of square. This whole stuff under that substitution becomes this. Indeed, as predicted, if there was nothing on the right side, then it would set this to zero, therefore M prime would be zero, therefore M of R would be a constant, and that constant would be given the name capital M. So it's all reducing as it should. And therefore we have, now notice also that capital G drops out from the equation on both sides. Okay, So we see that M, uh, so M prime of R is equal to 4 pi R square rho of R. And this is easily integrated. So this is M of R is 4 pi integral d r r squared from 0 to, so this is a dummy variable r prime and it's integrated from 0 to r. Alright? So we found m, therefore we found beta. Now can someone give a physical interpretation of m of r? It is apparently the mass and yet it's not. It's a very strange quantity. So this equation I can erase because we solved it. This equation I'm going to erase, but we'll have to use it. We'll have to bring it back. So anyway, now, for now I'm going to erase it. And the last we bring the equations back when we put them. So why do I say that this is the mass or it's not the mass? Well, okay. So uh, it looks like m of r is the mass contained inside the sphere of radius r. It's a reasonable quantity to have. Okay, It's very much like what happens in electrostatics where the quantity appearing when we try to find a regular solution for a charged body with some charge density is that the field is sourced by the amount of charge inside the sphere where we are probing the field. So something like that. However, uh, <clears throat> okay, before I go on and forgetting about the interpretation, Let's notice that if R is the matter radius, I have introduced this quantity over here, so that there is vacuum outside that, that would be the case when T mu nu, all components, namely P and rho, vanish for R greater than R tilde. Then uh, M for any R greater than R tilde is the integral 0 to R tilde dr So after R crosses R tilde this parameter M becomes a constant and now we know what that constant should be right because that constant is the constant appearing in the short shell solution because that's a vacuum solution. So therefore, this is actually equal to M, the mass of 
the star or whatever the object or whatever that object is, the total mass. Right. So it looks like everything fits nicely. It's the integral over the of the density and it's equal to the mass. What, what else could we expect? Well, there's a small puzzle. For a density, rho of r uh, in the given space time, m should be equal to the mass should be integral d3x root f of the 3 metric above. Now this doesn't really seem to give us what we are finding because the 3 metric is just the part of the metric by ignoring time. So g3 ij is just what I wrote before except so it's e to the 2 beta r squared and r squared times squared beta. So root set of this g is equal to r squared sin theta e to the 2 e to the beta. And therefore mass <coughs> so I need a name for this. So let me call this M tilde. Therefore M tilde is equal to integral d r r squared. The integral over d theta d phi sin theta gives me 4 pi. That's as before. But there is now e to the beta of r. In fact, I know e to the beta of r, so let me put it in. Maybe I want the, yeah, probably I want the mod of, I want it from 0 but I want the mod of this because it's the mod of so it's quite a, yeah, so this is perfectly okay. You can factor out root r from it and write it as root of r minus 2 gm. I think the integral will exist. The interesting thing that you can see from this that this quantity is strictly greater than m, the true mass, okay? because <coughs> at every point r, this factor is enhancing the integral. <coughs> the upper limit is r. So now let's try to give names to these two. So m is of course the true mass of the star. There is nothing to argue about that. m tilde is the mass that you would get by adding up the density of all the matter that is that it's made up of. Okay. So why is the mass of an object computed by adding up the density of all the matter of which it's made? Why would that be different from the actual mass of the object? Energy, binding energy. Okay. So if I took the matter making up the star and put it all far separated at infinity, each piece infinitely far away from each other piece and assembled the total value of its mass, I would get m tilde. But 
now to bring it all into the center and assemble it into a nice spherically symmetric thing takes some energy and that cost of energy is m minus m tilde minus m so is the binding energy and the sign goes the correct way because the mass of the object is less than just the mass of its constituents by the amount of the binding energy Does this have a charge system as well? If I have a charge distribution, if I have a separated charge, then mm -hmm. yeah, that doesn't. Whole factor is. Okay. Wait one minute. If I have a system of charges, and the other two will be total will be same. Yeah. So what have you? Right. Yeah. Sorry, are you asking if there is a binding charge? Okay. No, there is no binding charge. Kind of, yeah. There is a binding energy even for yeah, a system of charges. Okay, but there is no binding charge. No. So this is a unique, if you like, nonlinear effect due to the nonlinear nature of gravity. This is because mass energy Yes, this is. Sir, when the masses are very far apart, and when we assume that, I mean, the gravity will do that itself. I mean, it put extra energy, so do positive work on them to assemble them, right? Uh, <coughs> If they were no, uh, okay, okay, sorry. Actually, I'm, 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 I'm having a bit of problem with my signs again. And yeah, so I mean, it looks to me that since the gravitational force is attractive, yeah. I would have to do work to take them to infinity. Yeah, but they will then the sign. So I'm yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm very confused. So maybe I've got my sign wrong. So let's just see what is the value of this denominator. Uh, normal binding energy is defined as you have a bound system and uh, how much energy you have to put to take the constant yeah, with the that's fine yeah. but it could be of either sign okay it depends yeah. on what kind of system yeah. I have yeah. and depends it crucially on whether things are attractive or repulsive yeah. I have a feeling M tilde is less than M yeah that's what should be because this denominator is R minus 2 gm right basically and R minus 2 gm uh, varies from 2 gm to 0 now. So no, gm is greater than or less than 1? No, it should be less. It has to be. Yeah, I'm very confused now by this thing. It's a, so the, this should be from 0 to r. This is the denominator factor because e to the beta is that. And somehow I've convinced myself that m beta is greater than m, but I'm not so convinced anymore. In the mass when they are apart. should be the mass when they are apart. And when you actually come to that, actually gain some extra energy. Yeah, because it's an attractive force. So, in theory, there has to be some of the energy extra that you get plus the in mass. No, m is the no m is the mass of the star, is of the assembled object. So assembled object. Yes. Then it is correct. Yeah. Why is it correct? You are extracting. M is the assembled star. Yes. And the other one is disassembled. Yes. So the assembled was mass of the star. Why? Why? You get gain energy. Gain energy. You gain energy. Like by letting them fall, you can gain energy. So mass of what should be less? Mass of what should be less? Assembled object. Yeah. But is it actually from this integral? Is it obvious? Yeah, yeah. it is obvious yeah. because whatever it is, this is no. So this, for that, this should be a factor greater than one, right? But is it greater than one? Yeah. And you do the total good. rest mass. Very good. Let them form atom. 
So for an attractive force, the binding energy yeah. is positive, which means the mass of the assembled object is less. Yeah. But now, uh, therefore, M, therefore, this equality m tilde greater than m should be true. Yeah. Mm. But is it true from this formula? Suppose mm. so mm. MR itself depends on rho. So. Yeah, it's rather complicated to see. So it may not be easy to see. So I think maybe the only thing I'll withdraw is that it's not obvious to me why this inequality. Is. Yeah, but it, it is consistent. It should be it's consistent, yeah. But it should still be easy to see in the sense, take this, subtract 1, reorganize it, you know the sign of this denominator, it should be possible to see that it's, yeah? yeah? It should be possible. Okay, Chief. So then I think we are all happy and this is the binding energy. This is strictly an aside because the important thing is M. It's just that, curiously in this system, M comes out to be the integral of rho in a unit metric while M tilde comes out to be integral of rho in the true metric. Okay. That one M tilde you could have predicted, that's the actual sum over density. This one you just get from a formula, it's just a curiosity. Maybe I have even given it too much time. Okay, good. So now that we are done with this, the key result was that M was solved for and it was equal to the integral of rho. So M of R. done this, this implies also that beta is solved for So now we need to plug this into the GRR equation and that, that equation now becomes that is equation 2 as I have labeled it 1 by R squared 1 minus 2 GM over R this notation is nice to remember things. 2R alpha prime plus 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 2G n over R. This should be equal to 8 pi G G of R. So this is the second equation. Now this equation just involves the first derivative of alpha and that too only in that place. It's extremely nice for that reason. So it can't be very hard to rearrange the equation and solve for alpha prime. So if we do that, we find the alpha prime of R is G by R M plus of by P. So this solves for alpha prime thereby by integrating this once. In principle, we determine alpha in terms of P and rho. Yes. Alpha and beta are only unknowns here, right? Yeah. So yeah, well actually they're not. Alpha, beta, P and rho are all unknown. We've just thrown them into the system. Okay. And what we'll see is that and what you expect is that the Einstein equations determine alpha and beta in terms of P and rho. But you also expect that conservation of stress energy relates P and rho along with alpha and beta and it should be an independent relation. Okay, because it's a conservation equation. So you may expect that it relates them and we'll just see in a second that it does. Because of that, we'll also end up with one relation between P and rho. That in turn still doesn't fix both. The equation of state would be the last equation which would then fix everything. So although we initially started out to find the metric given P and rho, turns out that P and rho also are influenced by the metric. So it's a couple system. But we have three equations for four and one We have three equations for four unknowns, uh, and then the equation of state will make four equations for four unknowns. But probably we won't be going that far. Anyway, I want to sort of end now. So let me just so last equation. This could have been the theta theta equation, but alternatively, I'm going to write the equation p mu p mu r equals zero. It's quite instructive to work out what this is. So this is 
dr dr r plus d t t dr equals zero. There could be term with theta and phi values of the index, but they all, I believe, drop out. Derivatives, ordinary derivatives, will vanish because nothing depends on theta and phi. Uh, okay, uh, perhaps let me say that more precisely. Um, ordinary derivative in theta will act on t theta r and t phi r, those components are already zero. Okay. However, you may get, that's also true of ordinary derivative in t, which is inside here. But then the connection terms can contribute and you have to check that for theta and phi they don't. Right away looking at this, you may think that this term isn't doing anything, but turns out the connection terms here are very important. So let's write out all the things we get. This gives ordinary del r of tr. This is clearly important because every variable depends on r. Okay. The next term you get is 2 gamma r r r tr. One of them for each of the indices of t. Okay, that makes up this. Then there is del t of t tr, but this is 0 because t tr is itself 0, t being diagonal. Then there is gamma t t r. Now there are actually several terms. Okay. There would also be terms like gamma t t t times t t r, but those I have already dropped. Okay. Then there is gamma r t t t t t. And this is nice. Now you can see that in this equation we didn't think that the, we knew that the pressure is going to come in but here you see that the density is also managed to come in. Okay, so this involves everything in the system and in fact uh, just use the values, now you have to be careful these are all upper t's, so you have to raise the components of t using the inverse metric and when all the dust settles it gives a very nice equation that p prime of r is just equal to minus p plus rho into alpha prime of r. Okay. So I'm boxing the three equations that you derived. And this is very nice because these two boxed equations obviously allow us to eliminate alpha prime. And here, as I promised, is the relation purely among p and rho. p prime is equal to simply minus p plus rho into g by r into m plus 4 pi p r cube. I can't keep writing the dependencies, so you have to remember m depends on R, T depends on R, O depends on R. Moreover, M's, M depends on R because of this relation. So finally, M is determined purely by rho. So it's an integral function of rho. So this depends on rho, this depends on, this is P, and this is rho, and everything else is explicit. So, and this is P prime. So it's an internal relation within the energy momentum tensor variables. Okay, coming from conservation, but conservation doesn't give us something so trivial as we might have imagined that one or other of them is zero or something like that. Okay, it's more non-trivial than that. Of course, you can see that this is completely consistent with the fact that everything is zero. We have chosen the energy momentum tensor zero when we solve for the short shield solution. And of course, uh, if I put zero here, that's fine. It's a perfectly good solution. Okay, which is why we didn't encounter this equation that time. Okay, now this equation actually has a name. It's called the Tolman often equation. And it sort of determines the hydrostatic balance or the hydrostatic equilibrium of a star uh, and it's to be taken in conjunction to in conjunction with this which just relates the fluid 
the hydrostatic variables p and rho, you have the solution for m, and this in principle gives you the solution for alpha, and therefore you have the intervention. Now you can't go any further than this without having some idea of what kind of material you are using. Okay, there are many kinds of material you could use. One interesting material would be to uh, think about what if this was a cosmological fluid that is equal to, to the cosmological constant, then p plus rho would be zero, so this would be constant, so then this is trivial, trivially solved by constant p, uh, any constant p and rho obviously, uh, but you could still then find alpha, you have still found alpha and beta for that system, which I think basically is one of your homeworks. So I think I've solved your homework assignment here. Uh, the questions in the second homework. Secondly, you could imagine uh, some other equation of state, uh, which could be. So people talk about equations of state <coughs> of various kinds, but. The point to emphasize is this is nothing to do with gravity. This is to do with the behavior of that particular fluid. We've not said anything, so it's surprising we've got so many results without saying anything about the fluid at all, except that it has a pressure and a density, and is uh, in that and it has that form of nu. So, for example, people talk about I don't know. I saw this one. P is proportional to some power of rho. So P is P A proportional to gamma. Such a thing would allow to solve completely, in principle of course, for the metric of the star. Another way be to say it's incompressible matter in which case you insist that rho equals constant for r less than r tilde and equals zero for r greater than r tilde. Turns out that in this case you can quite easily integrate this equation and find p. Okay. And once you are done with everything, you can even integrate that and basically you can write the entire explicit metric of an incompressible star, but I decided that it's too much work to do in class and probably doing the integration won't teach you anything new. The important new things are these equations and now you can plug into them any factual assumptions you want to make about the matter making of the star and find the metric. The nice thing, I suppose, if you do the example, okay, two things, uh, two final comments. One is that I think it's pretty manifest here that this, whatever you get here will match smoothly onto the vacuum solution, it has the same symmetries and in fact has pretty much the same form and anytime uh, any of these things vanishes, for example, outside some radius r equals r tilde, if you want to make the density and uh, pressure vanish, uh, what will happen is that m will turn into a constant there because it will be the it will be the total mass, and everything else will be zero, and the equations uh, all become quite easy to integrate, and you get back the short solution. So it's quite easy to see that it matches smoothly. Whenever r comes below r tilde, it matches smoothly on this. That's one comment. Yes. Sir, uh, it matches with the vacuum solution outside the matter. Yes. Uh, is it an accident or something we have introduced somewhere in our derivation? I think it's basically built into our derivation because we've solved an equation for which the matter thing is a special case, right? The, the vacuum solution is a special case. It is the special case when p and rho are zero. Okay. And now what we are saying is that when we are beyond r equals r tilde, p and rho really are zero by definition of r tilde. So it has to match. Okay. How smoothly it has to match, I can't say. I don't uh, remember. This solution in, in particular is very explicit, so it's nice to work this one out for the incompressible case. But it may or may not be realistic.
Anyway, there was one more comment, but I can't. Yeah, okay. So, I'll stop with that. And as I said, next time, I'll talk about this directly symmetric solution for the last time, and then we'll talk about the first one. Yeah. Gravitational radiation, you know, actually I'm wondering whether gravitational radiation could be one of the topics for one of your projects. We are running out of, I've gone very slow in this course, that's the reality. But uh, we are running out of lectures. In the worst case, one lecture on gravitational radiation. Let's see. We still have some time. So,